2,500 years ago, one man's spiritual journey was the beginning of one of the world's major religions. Today it boasts 376 million followers. He is simply called the Buddha, and he grew up the son of a king, sheltered from the realities of human suffering. When he finally learned the harsh truth, he left his family and set off on a path to understand life itself, first as a monk and then as a teacher. In this week's biographics, we take a look at the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. The founder of Buddhism was a man named Siddhartha Gautama. He was the son of a chieftain and believed to be born in Lumbini, modern-day Nepal, in the 6th century BC. His father, Suddhodana, translating to he who grows pure rice, presided over a large clan called the Shakya, in either a republic or an oligarchy system of rule. His mother was Queen Maya of Sakya, who is said to have died shortly after his birth. The infant was given the name Siddhartha, meaning he who achieves his aim. When Siddhartha was still a baby, several seers with the power of supernatural insight into the future predicted he would either be a great spiritual leader, military leader, or a king. Since Siddhartha's mother died, he was brought up by his maternal aunt, Mahapajapati. His father, hoping to steer Siddhartha in the direction of the throne, shielded him from any religion of any kind and sheltered him from seeing human hardship and suffering. As such, he was raised in the lap of luxury and blissful ignorance, where he knew nothing about aging, disease, or death. At the age of 16, Siddhartha's father arranged his marriage to his cousin, Yasadhara, who was also a teenager. She gave birth to Rahula some years later. Siddhartha is said to have remained living in the palace until the age of 29, and that was when everything changed. According to the story, one day Siddhartha traveled outside of the palace gates, and he was deeply disturbed by the sight of an old man. His charioteer, Channa, explained to Siddhartha that all people grow old, and that death is an integral part of life. This prompted Siddhartha to secretly venture outside the palace on more and more trips. When leaving, it was said that the horse's hooves were muffled by the gods, so as to prevent the guards from knowing of his departure. Outside the gates, on these trips, he encountered a sick man, a decaying corpse, and a homeless, holy man, also known as an ascetic. Chana told Siddhartha that ascetics give up their material possessions and forego physical pleasures for a higher spiritual purpose. After witnessing the reality of human hardship and suffering, Siddhartha had no interest in living at the palace. He left his wife and child to discover the true meaning of life, first by living as a traveling beggar like the ascetics that he saw on the streets. Siddhartha first went to the city of Rajagaha and began begging on the streets in order to survive. He was recognized there by the king's men and he was offered the throne. He rejected it, but promised to come back and visit once he had attained enlightenment. Once he left the city, he met a hermit Brahmin saint named Alara Kalama. Kalama taught Siddhartha a form of meditation known as the Sphere of Nothingness. Siddhartha eventually became his teacher's equal, and Kalama offered him his place, saying, You are the same as I am now. There is no difference between us. Stay here and take my place and teach my students with me. But Siddhartha, he didn't stay, and instead he moved on to another teacher, Udaka Ramaputta. Once again, he achieved high levels of meditative consciousness and was asked to succeed his teacher. Siddhartha refused the offer once again, and he moved on. Through the practice of meditation, Siddhartha realized a state of perfect equanimity and awareness, and he was on the path to enlightenment. He also realized that living life as an extremely deprived beggar, as he had done, wasn't working. It had been six years, and he had eaten very little and fasted until he was incredibly weak. After starving himself for days, Siddhartha famously accepted milk and rice pudding from a village girl named Sujata. He was so emaciated, she thought he was a spirit there to grant her a wish. Siddhartha, after having this meal, decided against living the life of extreme self-denial since his spiritual goals were not being met. He instead opted to follow a path of balance, known in Buddhism as the Middle Way. At this turning point, his five followers believed he was giving up 
and they abandoned him. Soon after, he began meditating under a fig tree and committed himself to staying there until he had found enlightenment. He meditated for six days and nights and reached enlightenment on the full moon morning of May, a week before he turned 35. At the time of his enlightenment, he gained complete insight into the cause of suffering and the steps necessary to eliminate it. He called these steps the Four Noble Truths. After his awakening, the Buddha met two merchant brothers from the city of Balka in modern-day Afghanistan. The brothers, Trapusa and Bahalika, offered the Buddha his first meal after enlightenment, and they became his first lay disciples. According to some texts, each of these brothers gave a hair, and they were enshrined at a temple in Rangoon, Burma. Legend has it that initially Buddha was reluctant to spread his knowledge to others as he was doubtful of whether the common people would understand his teachings. But then the king of gods, Brahma, convinced Buddha to teach and that was what he set out to do. The Buddha traveled to Deer Park in northern India, where he set in motion what Buddhists call the Wheel of Dharma by delivering his first sermon to the five companions who had abandoned him earlier. Together with him, they formed the first five Buddhist monks. All five attained Nirvana, a state along the path to enlightenment, yet not full enlightenment. They were known as the ones who are worthy or perfected people. From the first group of five, it steadily grew to 60 within the first few months, and eventually the Sangha reached more than 1,000 people. People. The Sangha traveled through the subcontinent expounding the Dharma. This continued throughout the year, except during the four months of the Vasa rainy season, when ascetics of all religions rarely traveled. One reason was that it was more difficult to do so without causing harm to animal life. At this time of year, the Sangha would retreat to monasteries, public parks, or forests where people would come to them. The first Vasana was spent at Varanasi when the Sangha was formed. After this, the Buddha kept a promise to travel to Rajagaha, the capital of Magadha, to visit King Bimbisara. During this visit, Saraputta and Maud Galiyayana were converted to Asai, one of the first five disciples. After this, they were to become the Buddha's two foremost followers. The Buddha spent the next three seasons at Velavana Bamboo Grove Monastery in Rajagaha, the capital of Magadha. Upon hearing of his son's awakening, Siddhahana sent, over a period, ten delegations to ask him to return. On the first nine occasions, the delegates failed to deliver the message and instead joined the Sangha to become Arahants. The tenth delegation, led by Kaladai, a childhood friend of Gautama, who also became an Arafant, however, delivered the message. Now, two years after his awakening, the Buddha agreed to return and made a two-month journey by foot to Kapilavastu, teaching of the Dharma as he went. At his return, the royal palace prepared a midday meal, but the Sangha was making an alms round in Kapilavastu. Hearing this, Suthodana approached his son, the Buddha, saying, Ours is the warrior lineage of Mahamasatra, and not a single warrior has gone seeking alms. The Buddha is said to have replied, That is not the custom of your royal lineage, but it is the custom of my Buddha lineage. Several thousands of Buddhas have gone by seeking alms. Buddhist texts say that Suthodana invited the Sangha into the palace for the meal, followed by a Dharma talk. After this, he is said to have become a Satotpana. During the visit, many members of the royal family joined the Sangha. The Buddha's cousins, Anada and Anuradha, became two of his five chief disciples. At the age of seven, his son Rahula also joined and became one of his ten chief disciples. His half-brother, Nanda, also joined and became an Arahant. His wife, reportedly, became a nun. Throughout his life, Buddha encouraged his students to question his teachings and confirm them through their own experience. This non-dogmatic attitude still characterizes Buddhism today. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world, and it is also one of the oldest, established in the 6th century BC in present-day Nepal, India. Unlike other religions, Buddhists do not worship a god. Instead, they focus on spiritual development with the end goal of becoming enlightened, though not in the intellectual sense of the word. In the Western world, enlightenment is most often associated with the 18th century European Enlightenment period, a movement characterized by a rational and scientific approach to politics, religion, and social and economic 
issues. In Buddhism, the simplest explanation of attaining enlightenment is when an individual finds out the truth about life and experiences an awakening, where they are freed from the cycle of being reborn. Central to Buddhism is the notion that to live is to suffer, and everything is in a constant state of change. All Buddhists believe unless one has become enlightened, they will be reincarnated again and again. These four principles that the Buddha came to understand during his meditation under the Bodhi tree. These are the truth of suffering, Dukkha, the truth of origin of suffering, Samadaya, the truth of cessation of suffering, Niradha, and the truth of the path of cessation of suffering, Magga. Suffering comes in many forms. Three obvious kinds are suffering corresponding to the first three sights the Buddha saw on his first journey outside his palace. Old age, sickness, and death. To the Buddha, the problem of suffering goes much deeper, though. Life is not ideal. It frequently fails to live up to our expectations. Human beings are subject to desires and cravings, but even when we are able to satisfy these desires, the satisfaction is only temporary. Pleasure does not last, and if it does, it becomes monotonous. Even when we are not suffering from outward causes like illness or bereavement, we are unfulfilled or unsatisfied. This is simply the truth of suffering. The next noble truth is the origin of suffering. Our day-to-day -day troubles may seem to have easily identifiable causes. Thirst, pain from an injury, sadness from the loss of a loved one. In the second of his noble truths, though, Buddha claimed to have found the cause of all suffering, and it is much more deeply rooted than our immediate worries. The Buddha taught that the root of all suffering is desire, tanya. This comes in three forms, which he describes as the three roots of evil, or the three fires, or the three poisons. The three roots of evil are greed and desire, represented in art by a rooster, ignorance or delusion, represented by a pig, and hatred and destructive urges, represented by a snake. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering, Niroda. The Buddha taught that the way to extinguish desire which causes suffering is to liberate oneself from attachment. This is the third noble truth, the possibility of liberation. The Buddha was a living example that this is possible in a human lifetime. Estrangement here means disenchantment. A Buddhist aims to know sense conditions clearly as they are, without becoming enchanted or misled by them. Nirvana means extinguishing. Attaining Nirvana, reaching enlightenment, means extinguishing the three fires of greed, delusion, and hatred. Someone who reaches Nirvana does not immediately disappear to a heavenly realm. Nirvana is better understood as a state of mind that humans can reach. It is a state of profound spiritual joy without negative emotions and fears. Someone who has attained enlightenment is filled with compassion for all living things. After death, an enlightened person is liberated from the cycle of rebirth, but Buddhism gives no definite answers as to what happens next. The Buddha discouraged his followers from asking too many questions about Nirvana. He wanted them to concentrate on the task at hand, which was freeing themselves from the cycle of suffering. Asking questions is like quibbling with the doctor who is trying to save your life. The fourth noble truth is the path to the cessation of suffering, Magga. This final noble truth is the Buddha's prescription for the end of suffering. This is a set of principles called the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is also called the Middle Way. It avoids both indulgence and severe asceticism, neither of which the Buddha found helpful in his search for enlightenment. The eight stages are not to be taken in order, but rather support and reinforce each other. At the age of 80, Buddha announced that he would soon reach Parinirvana, or the final deathless state, and abandon his earthly body. After this, the Buddha ate his last meal, which he had received as an offering from a blacksmith named Kunda. Falling violently ill, Buddha instructed his attendant, Anada, to convince Kunda that the meal eaten at his place had nothing to do with his passing, and that his meal would be a source of the greatest merit as it provided the last meal for a Buddha. The Buddha's teachings began to be codified shortly after his death, and continued to be followed one way or another, and with major discrepancies, by at least 400 million people to this day. There are numerous different schools and sects of Buddhism. The two largest are Theravada Buddhism, which is mostly popular in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Burma, Myanmar. And then there is Mahayana Buddhism, which is strongest in Tibet, China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and Mongolia. Buddhist sects do not typically look to preach and convert people, but they do look to help people on the path to enlightenment. If with a pure mind a person speaks or acts, happiness follows them like a never-departing shadow.
So I really hope you enjoyed that episode of Biographics. If you did, there's a couple of things you could do right now. One is hit that like button below. Also, if you want more stuff like this, we put out brand new videos every Monday and every Thursday. So hit that subscribe button below. And subscribe button doesn't do what it used to on YouTube. If you actually want to get a notification about these videos, please do hit that bell button next to the subscribe button. And that'll send you a notification every time, every Monday and Thursday when we put out a new video. Also, if you want to watch something else right now, stuff from the archive, over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.